Thank you for coming today. I'm Wendy Edwards. I'm chair of the visual art department here at Brown and on the executive committee of the Brown Arts Initiative. This is the 2017 Andy Warhol Endowed Artist Talk. For over 25 years, Tanya Bruguera has created socially engaged performances and installations that examine the nature of political power structures and their effect on the lives of society's most vulnerable individuals and groups. Her research focuses on ways in which art can be applied to the everyday political life, on the transformation of social effect into political effectiveness. Her long-term projects are intensive interventions on the institutional structure of collective memory, education, and politics. Her works often expose the social effects of political forces and present global issues of power, migration, censorship, and repression through participatory works that turn viewers into citizens. By creating proposals and aesthetic models for others to use and adapt, she defines herself as an initiator rather than an author and often collaborates with multiple institutions as well as many individuals so that the full realization of her artwork occurs when other, uh, others adopt and perpetuate it. Awarded an honoris causa by the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, selected one of the 100 leading global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine, shortlisted for the Index 100 Freedom of Expression Award, a Herb Albert Award winner, currently a Radcliffe and a Yale World Fellow, and the first artist in residence in the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. She participated in Documenta 11 exhibition and also established the Arte Conducta, the behavior art program at Instituto Superior de Art in Habana. Her work has been shown in the 2015 Venice Biennale, at the Tate Modern, London, Guggenheim, and MoMA, New York, among others. Bruguera has recently opened the Hannah Arendt International Institute for Artivism in Havana, a school, exhibition space, and think tank for artists and art activists and Cubans. Born in 1968 in Havana, Cuba, she lives and works in Havana, New York, and Cambridge. Please help me welcome Tanya Bruguera. Thank you, Wendy, um, and thank you, uh, Brown uh, University, for inviting me and the art program. And thank you for the students uh, I saw today and, and share some time with. Um, I'm going to do uh, the orientation I have for this talk is to do it quick so we have time for QA. So you better have some QAs. <laughs> no, I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, um, I want to start by saying that um, I'm going to try to talk today, uh, see my work through the lens of uh, a concept I'm trying to, to develop uh, that is, uh, actually, as you have seen by Wendy's uh, presentation, many of my, the concepts of my work are in Spanish. So, um, loving having an American trying to speak Spanish, the same way I try to speak English. Um, but in this case, uh, I'm trying to create this, uh, this, develop this concept called uh, Estetica. And it is, of course, um, coming out of a discussion I had with one uh, critic that said that political art had no, uh, had no aesthetics, that it was all propaganda, and, and so on. So I think uh, because the times we are right now is uh, good to maybe focus on that. The question I always ask myself um, when I'm doing art, and unfortunately every time I do a new piece, is what is art for? And uh, the reasoning for that is that I feel that after 100 years, 1917, we have a still uh, continue looking at the same um, the same way of creating art. We have created a fake dichotomy between something that we can think is related to the art market and something we think is, oh, sorry, and something we think is created uh, for propaganda issues, uh, purposes. So one of the things I want to um, propose is how can we see 
political art, not as propaganda, and not, um, but as an effective way to deal with affect, uh, affect. And I come, of course, from um, Cuba. Uh, and this is extremely important because I think part of the uh, problem uh, why we have this dichotomy between uh, a tradition in art that comes from the Champ and a tradition in art that comes from the uh, Russian constructivists, uh, Soviet constructivists, is that many, many times we forget how important the context is, context is to uh, understand the art the person is doing. So very quickly, I'm going to give you a quick context. So I come from Cuba where, as you see here, um, they were uh, fighting against the impossible and they won. That's uh, one of the propagandas uh, um, that we have lived with. And another thing is we live in a place where we felt that every injustice needed to be fought. No matter where it was, no matter who was uh, being um, unjust, uh, unjustly um, treated. So, of course, uh, we have also something which is a difference between the Che Guevara that you know and the Che Guevara that we know. So this is one of the contradictions that start to happen where you live in a place that means so much for other people, but for you it means something absolutely differently. Or you have uh, another approach, a more human approach to an issue. And of course, everything is a fight. And, um, and of course, um, the, the art in this context is a weapon for the revolution. So basically what I want, want to do with my work is to transform affect into uh, political effectiveness. I don't know if I have accomplished it, but at least I'm trying every time. Uh, why? Because I think this is the, as the moment in which art and politics can coincide. I think both artists and politicians work with affect and work in towards um, the use of um, affect. So I'm going to show you very quickly some uh, working interests that I have in my work. Um, I started in 19, 1985 um, with doing, doing an homage to Ana Mendieta. And of course, uh, what I did is I redid every um, uh, her performances and some of her work after she died, it, almost immediately after. And of course, that created a big uh, uh, dilemma because a lot of people were asking about authorship. And then I realized that I'm not interested in the traditional um, construction of authorship, authorship, but in seeing art as a cultural dialogue that you do collectively and you carry on uh, one after another. Uh, like a conversation. So another thing that happened in this kind of project is that I was finding out what is the role of artists in society. If the role of artists is not anymore to create new, new images, uh, this kind of novelty, uh, it means that maybe it has to, um, I wanted to rethink what I was doing as an artist in society. Again, coming from Cuba, you had all this um, education back then where you understood that your work was in uh, for the majority of the people, not for your own uh, satisfaction. Which also creates some other dilemmas, but uh, we can go there later. Uh, and another thing that happened when I was doing this piece is that I realized that at least in certain contexts, and here in the United States you are approaching that context, a lot of um, a context in which uh, the politics are being co-opted by a certain group of people that ha they think they have um, the truth of what is happening and they have their only right, their sole right, to define the meaning of what is happening. Uh, everything you do is political. So I realized that when I was doing this homage, which was basically a very nice homage to a person I admire, um, it was taken politically by the government. Um, and it was taken as a, um, some sort of uh, provocation, which I had no intent. But so these are um, this is another um, another uh, work that I did in '98, uh, and it is a piece where I take um, 
the figure of the Nkisi Konde, which is a Congolese, uh, a Congo icon, uh, religious icon, and I perform it, I appropriate as an individual person. And the aspect I was interested at is that um, in this icon, if you don't fulfill your promise, it will come back to harm you. So I wanted to have a parallel between this kind of uh, religious tradition that people will be probably close to and the unfulfilled promises uh, that the revolution had done. But of course, we ha I had some dilemmas. Um, the first dilemma is that, yes, I wanted to do art for as many people as possible. So I had to uh, start negotiating what is the language I was going to use and how important it was that people uh, uh, were working the same codes. But also, I realized that something happened. A police guy came. It was Fidel Castro's birthday. And, um, and they say, what's going on? And then one of the kids say, it's art. The police got like almost in shock, like the brain was not working for a little bit. And then he say, OK, proceed. And I say, OK, this is a problem. <laughs> because if m my intention is to talk to as many people as possible, and that includes people in power, uh, the people who make decisions. So I realized after that that I was going to change from doing my art using symbolic, uh, the realm of the symbolic representation, and instead uh, proposing to have a direct experience. Um, another piece I did in 93 and 94 was a newspaper. Of course, here that means nothing, but in Cuba, still today, um, more than 20 years later, um, or 20 years later, um, the newspapers are um, only controlled by the government. So it is illegal to print and distribute um, uh, a newspaper. So what I did is I, I realized when I say, okay, I don't want to do more like symbolic stuff because also I realized that people could change what the symbolism mean very easily because you are not in control of that so much. I say, okay, I'm going to do the thing that look like the thing and operates like the thing and everybody think is the thing. Uh, we sh bring another problem which is People asking, where is the art? And uh, for me, the art is a temporary condition of experiences. For me, the art is not something that resides for the full amount of time the thing exists. It is the moment in which certain emotional and, uh, um, uh, you know, emotional and also, uh, you know, um, forgot the word, um, uh, you know, uh, thoughts come together and, a, and, and create a, a situation that you didn't think will help, will see, uh, sorry, I'm going to say. So it's uh, the emotional, but also the, the kind of uh, mental process in which you can see things in a different way. So yeah, every time I talk to, about Cuba, I get a little <laughs> confused. Uh, so, so I see in this case, I created the, the newspaper and it was circulated uh, very small, but it was circulated among people. So what I realized is that if I wanted to talk to power, if I wanted to talk to people who actually have the option to make some decisions, I wanted to appropriate their language. Why? Because many, many times politicians and now in the United States, this is going to happen as well. So many times politicians discard um, art, like something that is not important, that something that is a bunch of pe whining people, you know. But if you adopt the language in which they are talking, if, if you co-op the spaces they are uh, emb embodying, then they will pay attention to you. Because then you enter in the, the you know, you are actually in a way threatening them or at least forcing them to have a conversation on the same space, on their same uh, arena. And of course, another thing that I do all the time as an artist is I, I think I put uh, propaganda to test. Meaning the same way I was performing the icon, uh, the African icon, I think I perform 
different, um, let's say, artistic beliefs or this different uh, political belief. So I tried to say, okay, I believe everything you say, I'm going to perform as if all of this is true. And then of course, reality uh, takes over. So I am a performance artist and I think that really uh, also inform all the projects I'm doing. But um, I realized, uh, in this case, for example, um, I realized at some point like performance didn't work for me anymore. Uh, I had some limitations because they, the, the, the issue related to identity politics or gender, uh, etc. So I was like, okay, I want to talk from another position. So I decided um, to, to change um, the way I position myself as a, a performance artist. In this case, I did a, an, an art piece where I signed with another artist um, the right of each other to take the body of whoever dies first to do a performance. So in this case, I almost feel this is my uh, declaration about performance arts. <laughs> and then I feel <coughs> that from, from that moment on, I, I shift. And instead of working with the limit of the body and the identity, um, I was working in the limits of society because in this case, we had to go through a lot of legal procedures, etc. So instead of performance, we, we were doing arte de conducta, which I, is like behavior art. But also that brought, that brought a question, and a question that is always happening in my work is what is what is the art? What is the art? So in this case, a lot of people were confused. Is the art the gesture, the performance of signing this legal contract, or is it the actual paper? Um, or is it actually whatever you're going to do when one of you died, hopefully years from now? Um, another thing I realized is um, doing, um, going into more direct political art that I needed to start collaborating not only uh, with other artists but also with institutions that could be um, in a way infiltrated or, or, or allies uh, in order to create sustainable change. Um, so, okay, other working uh, guidelines for my work. I always also, um, work from the political imaginary, whether that is uh, the way in which people see something without experiencing it or from afar, whether that is um, an empowered position in which you can imagine yourself in a different um, scenario. So in this case, um, I did this piece. It was a sugar cane. Uh, you walk towards the, it was, actually it's funny because the piece was completely black. But in order to show it to you, I had to have some images. So um, you walk all the way to the, I think I have a point here. You, were, you go all the way here to the, to, the, to the television. And then you will see there a video that very, uh, has various images of Fidel. And one of these uh, recurring images is him opening up to show that he has no vest. Um, but of course, the really vulnerable people were the people who were naked uh, there in the presence. So that piece was talking about what are the languages of vulnerability of power. But uh, also it was done uh, during the first time the American, uh, in this biennial with a lot of Americans came and, and talking about what people want to see and what people do not want to see. So another thing I do is I work with people's professional experience. What that means is that I don't work with actors so I do go to whatever, um, you know, the person who do the, um, the job, let's say, that is related to the situation I'm, I'm talking. So in this case, uh, the, the mounted police in England uh, was uh, asked to come to the museum and use the crowd control technique on the audience of the museum. Of course, in order for the piece to work, we didn't announce it, so my name was removed from all of the uh, publicity, and also nobody knew that uh, this work was happening. Um, 
Another thing, um, and one of the reasons why I do this is because, for example, those policemen, they were really good at doing their job, but as soon as one person decided not to follow orders, you could see immediately how they became you know, the body of, of uh, repression. It's something that they have, it's automatic. So I really like the tension between the, the automatic learn, the thing that you have learned uh, to do automatically, and the things that you have to struggle to uh, respond to. Um, so in this case, I also work with uh, people's political memory, which unfortunately is uh, getting amnesiac very quickly. But um, one example is this piece I did in um, uh, Russia, where uh, you could see a piece from a peephole, or you could decide to participate. That's another thing. I give the audience an option to either be a passive, uh, you know, viewer or um, get involved. Um, so if you get involved, you have these people who will give you these beautiful monkeys. Uh, you could choose between, between monkeys and eagles. And you could have your family picture uh, taken by them. And of course, immediately good service, you give the photo. And they realized for the first time that they were next to the photo of the KGB um, initiate creator. So one thing that is very, uh, that I tried to use in this uh, piece is how do you use a spectacle and diversion in order to get your objective? Something politicians do very uh, often and now we have somebody who do that very skillfully. So um, of course there are people who are always happy to remember old times. Uh, although there were some people who didn't want to participate when they realized who the person was. But uh, many people thought this was just a generic hero. So that really scared me. Um, because we need to understand what is the importance of political memory. So recontextualizing the work is something I do a lot. I, when I'm invited to places, um, I don't do the same piece. Uh, I don't transport the piece. I translate the piece. So in this case, a curator asked me, OK, I like this piece. Can we do something like kind of the same in Germany? I say, no, no. Germany has other political imaginaries. And back then, this is, um, this is how you know I'm old. Uh, back then, the political imaginary about Germany was solely or mostly Nazi history. So I want to do a piece about that and about our own uh, participation in repression our own uh, looking away kind of attitude. So I think that person here is the best audience member because he's really performing the idea of the piece, which is you don't want to even see what's going on. So the piece was the opposite. The other one was really dark, and this was extremely bright. But if you, and, and it had a sound of like marching and cocking a gun. But if you were in the right position, you could see an actual person, you know, here. An actual person was with a gun. Um, <clears throat> and that really was extremely uh, intense, especially in Germany where guns are forbidden. Uh, so here you have another view. So what I try to do is how can you bring to a new space, to the new context, the same conversation? But of course, it will have to be translated. They will, you will have to use different verbs, you will have to use different um, metaphors and, and different um, references. So another thing I do is I try as much as possible to integrate art into everyday political life. What I mean by that, for example, I did this project, the Party of Migrant People, which is a project, uh, is part of a larger project called Immigrant Movement International, which is happening in different places. And the main goal of it is how can we see immigrants as political subjects with power and political power instead of solely um, uh, labor um, capital? So in this case, we, did, we have done a lot of actions and a lot of little things here and there. And we were invited to do something in, in Mexico with the project. And we decided to, to have 100 voceros we shout the people who, who, who read the headlines, shout the headlines so people buy the newspapers, a long tradition in uh, Latin America. And instead of shouting the news, 
we asked them to shout the rights we wanted for immigrants. And that was done next to the, the presidential palace, and it was during the uh, uh, election uh, campaign. Of course, one thing that happened with this kind of work is how can you document the work? How can you document this kind of work where it's an experience, people hear about it, there are like three kind of audiences in a way. There is the, the people who are uh, a source audience, let's say the people for which the project is being done, the people who, who bring all the knowledge to the piece, who, who are producing the content of the piece. You have a primary audience, meaning the people who have experienced the work, even if it's not related to them. And then you have secondary audience, the people who have no idea what's going on, and somebody tell them maybe in a party or somewhere else, have you seen this or have read the, an article? So I say, okay, maybe for a project like this, the best way to document is not the rumor, is not the conversation, is not a photo, it's not a video, uh, but it is actually to try to integrate the party of migrant people among the 50 potential new parties for the next sexennial, like the next six year uh, for the next election in Mexico. And for me, that's the way I wanted to archive the project. So it is part of, in a way, um, a historical document. So, okay. As uh, Wendy was saying, I do not like to call myself an artist, but I call myself an initiator. The reason for that is that I feel there is a kind of ethical and ontological uh, contradiction when artists who do social engage, engaged projects or social experiment projects or, or audience participatory projects, how the artist is claiming the sole, um, uh, the sole ownership of the work where the responsibility of producing the work is shared with the participant and shared with the audiences. And in many, many cases, especially if you do long-term projects and if you do uh, social engaged projects, many of these ideas, many of the original ideas you come with in the com to the community are changed and many times even discarded. So how can you say I'm the author of a project? when you come with something and maybe it goes somewhere else. So I think I like to call myself an initiator as a way to say, okay, I recognize that I came up with an idea, but, um, and this is an example. I did a project in, the many, uh, in Cuba in 2009 where um, I invited people to talk on a microphone for one minute. And of course the project, um, the participation of the people were what made the piece. One of the elements, one of the few symbolic elements of the piece uh, was the reproduction, again, of the uh, political memory of when Fidel uh, spoke for the first time um, after the revolution and all this uh, dove came to him and people were saying like, oh, he's the selected one, the shoes and God, whatever. You know, everybody was excited. I say, okay, let's, uh, let's deal with this historical um, dilemma. And what we did is we work with uh, these uh, magicians who trained the dove in order to stay in people's shoulder. Uh, of course, uh, part of the participation of the audience is not only to, you know, to, to, in this case, it was not only to talk, but also to be the responsible for the documentation of the work, because I gave, this is very old piece, I gave 200 discarded, um, cameras, disposable cameras with flash. Now we don't need that, we have old telephones. Um, and, and it was very interesting because sometimes what looks like a, and this is one thing that happens in political art, that sometimes you make decisions that look like aesthetical decision. Like I say, okay, if somebody's talking, I want a lot of flashes, so the person feels it's really important, etc. But what I realized after the piece started and became really, really tense is that those cameras were actually the protection people had because each of these camera had photos that could circulate uh, beyond the control of the state. So I, using the logic of not an artist but an initiator, I wanted to see if maybe instead of political artist, I can be a political initiator. We'll see, I'm still trying. Um, another thing I do with my work is understanding the different time frame of the work. Um, and I'm going to probably stop here because it's 45 minutes. Okay, so, okay. 
Um, so the time frame is that I divide my work in short-term pieces. Everything you have seen so far are short-term pieces. What I mean by short-term pieces, pieces that you can experience very quickly, where you have an experience and the actual work is processed after the experience is finished. When you go home, when you talk to your friends, when you create this conversation. Um, when all the images and the, and the concepts are unpacked by you later. Uh, unfortunately, these kind of short experiences many times are a little kind of violent uh, because, you know, you have to unpack something in a very short time. So the other way I divide my work is long-term projects. The long-term projects are related to this, um, I don't know, test if art can really change something. Um, and um, for this, I use different concepts. One is uh, institutional self-criticism or self-critique, meaning that I'm a, I am an institutional critique artist, but what I'm trying to do is destroy by building. So instead of just pointing at the institution, I try to build something that is, um, in a way, um, you know, like a mirror or, or like an alternative, and then the institution has to see this if an artist could be able to do it, why they cannot do it, you know? So in this case, I did, for example, an alternative to Instituto Superior de Arte, which was in coordination with them, but in this case, I entered the institution and infiltrated the institution in order to uh, make the institution think. And I have these ideas that institutions have to think, but they also have to feel, um, which uh, sometimes is hard to tell them. But, um, so in this case, I did this alternative uh, art school that was focusing solely uh, or mostly in social and political art. And uh, we experimented with a lot of formats, as you can see here. And we had a lot of fun, as you can see. Um, then Immigrant Movement International, I already talked a little bit about it. It, it is in a form of, uh, it is an actual space in Corona, Queens. You are all invited to go. And we created these spaces with artists and activists and political um, elected uh, officials uh, came, uh, journalists, academics, you know, everybody. And for me, the most important part of immigrant movement was not only that we had also an alternative kind of education, but that we uh, use art as a way to create an ecosystem of respect, something that and that's something that I do in this kind of long-term projects, create an ecosystem in which people enter a space where things function differently. They look the same. They look like a school, they look like a, like a, like a community art center, but when you enter, you can be a different person. You can be yourself. You are going to be respected and you can experience different things. In Cuba, I was feeling all the freedom that in the street you didn't feel, and immigrant movement is feeling the respect. Um, and one of the reasons for that is an strategy to see if you go, after having this knowledge, go outside of uh, the space and want to make reality the same way of that experience. These are some postcards we gave them to give to their friends. Oh, this is a, post, um, a big poster we did in uh, Austria. And this is a flag we did for an event uh, that we were invited, so. But these are different actions, but the overall um, is immigrant movement. And this is one of the latest pieces. It's a, a campaign, a si signature campaign, asking Pope Francis to give uh, Vatican City citizenship to undocumented immigrants in the world who doesn't matter what, uh, without looking at their uh, religious affiliation. So uh, aesthetics. This is the good thing about not speaking good English. You can see things in words that maybe other people are not seeing. And of course, you can compare to your own language. And of course, est in, in Latin is it is. So for me, aesthetics is the ethics of being ethic, uh, the aesthetic of becoming and creating a new ethics. And this is something I'm advocating. I'm advocating for. Um, I started by saying it's 100 years from the urinal of Duchamp and 100 years of the um, Soviet revolution slash uh, Soviet constructivism. And I think we need to start thinking of new ways to behave, new ways to 
challenge our political habits and new ways to create um, language for what we do, but also um, see if we can approach a new sense of uh, humanism. Thank you so much. Ah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if there is a. Okay. And I have more images, so I'm going to probably use you to put the other images. But. Good. Hi. Okay. Is this on? Mm hmm. Okay. Hi. Um, I was uh, wondering if you could speak a little bit about the interview that you did. Um, with Ai Weiwei at the Brooklyn Museum in which he was um, rather confrontational. And um, I guess if you could go back uh, to that interview, is there anything that you would say to refute mm -hmm. some of his uh, mm -hmm. claims? Um, I think uh, that's a problem to come to a school where people prepare, you see? <laughs> um, well, thank you for the question. I think I was actually extreme. are we recording? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> no, I don't care. Um, but I was very surprised because um, I was extremely honored to be invited to interview him. It was not a conversation, it was an interview. So already I was in a different position. I was in a position where I didn't have a lot of leverage to, I mean, I could question things, but it was, you know. So I was very surprised. Uh, about uh, some of the way he he reacted to to some of the criticism that people have asked him. I mean, I was not coming up with anything. I was just, uh, you know, uh, talking from all. Actually, a lot of people sent me things they wanted me to say because they couldn't say it to him directly. So I said, okay, let's do this. Um, so I think I was very surprised because. One of the things that, in my view, a political artist does is to understand consequences of the work. When you are a political artist, you work more, emph you emphatically work more towards understanding what are the potential consequences of the work than the pleasure of doing the work. And that's one of the things, that's maybe one of the reasons people don't like political art because the pleasure goes, reside in a different place. For example, I, um, I, I recently talked to, to, to a student and he was saying, yeah, but humor, I said, well, humor is complicated because you have to make sure that you laughed after you have achieved what you want, not before. Because if you laugh, <laughs> yes, if you laugh before, you are laughing at the person. If you laugh after, you are laughing at what you were able to make that person do. And it's a big difference. First, people don't get defensive. Secondly, people, uh, uh, other people beyond the people already on your side will understand. So in the case of our way, my only regret, uh, I don't regret anything. Um, my only regret, uh, except this, my only regret is when he say, how many people exactly died? And I say, and I was kind of, I'm a very good student, so I, I like to have all the facts and everything with them. And I was like, I don't know. But I didn't know, not because I didn't study. It was, I don't know because there is no number. As we spoke, they were changing, those numbers were changing. And the, the, that's the only thing I will have changed because I wanted to be respectful. <coughs> Because I was in a, if we were two artists talking, it would be very different. <laughs> but I was in a position of interviewing. So I wanted to, you know, I was performing that role. So I wanted to be, you know. And I think that's the only thing I, I regret not to say, you know, because I said at the end, but not at the moment, because I wanted to be um, elegant, which it doesn't work. So yeah, that's the only thing. But I said at the end, I said at the very end of the, yeah. And, and that's the thing, I feel, I feel, I was surprised because when you're a political artist and you are, I invite you to do that today, it's, it's good to, to, you can be defensive. You can, I mean, it makes no sense. That's the kind of attitude a, a traditional artist have. 
that's my truth, and you cannot challenge my truth. If you're a political artist, you know truth is changing all the time, and it's, a condition, it's conditioned by everything that happened, not only because of your desire, so. Is that answering? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, I guess the Bell Gallery, Gallery Next Door is about to show a Pierre Hui exhibition. Uh -huh. And, <coughs> you know, your work is very political, but I would say the short-term work sort of also relates to Pierre Hui's work, even though he sort of sees himself as a relational mm. aesthetic artist. Uh, mm. Can you sort of unpack that term in, from your understanding? And the relation you, aesthetic term? Yeah, and if how you see your political work as being different. <coughs> yeah, I feel, and I'm a good friend with Nicolas Borrell, so no problem there. And, but I feel that um, for me, one of the problems of um, <coughs> the term um, um, uh, relational aesthetics is that it did not, I, I mean, the, bo the book was not an academic book. So that's the first thing. So it was a kind of um, articles he wrote about this exhibition and the other that he was seeing, you know. It was more, um, you know, um, Oh, I have to help you. It was more like a, you know, it was not academic. So, so um, in this sense, there were a lot of injustices that happened when the book that was not intended to be academic, uh, but descriptional of what happened in certain places or some sort of ideas, he was, became a kind of a Bible for everybody. And people were looking in there, the, the first people who did this. And then, for example, I think Latin America has better examples of relational aesthetic than the ones that were used in the book. But it was not, I asked him, I said, why didn't you put these other people that you know? He said, well, it, it, they were reviews that I was writing for exhibitions. So it is very different. So, so I think that's my first problem uh, with the book, which is not only the book, but the way it was received. Um, the other thing is that I, the examples that were used mostly were examples where it felt that the main um, goal of the projects were conviviality instead of transformation. And in this sense, I'm oppo opposed to that and I'm going to take advantage and put some of the images. So I'm going to show you very quickly. For example, this is, something, this is my response to that my response to um, relation aesthetic is a concept of arte util, which is art as a tool or art um, that is uh, useful in a way. Got a lot of rejections. Every time, this is the other thing, when you're a political artist, you, I think you have to do political art not only towards the dictators or towards the politician, but also towards the injustices in our world. And that's not very happy ending conversations. Um, so in this case, for example, in, in the case of Arte Util, I think that I not only want to advocate me, and now we are a group. We have an association of Arte, Arte Util, who now we're going to do the first school of Arte Util in San Francisco this summer. Um, and, but we are also advocating for asking the institution, the art institution, what are they for? What are their role right now? Because we also feel that um, uh, relational aesthetic all, only were uh, focused on this kind of exchanges, but did not go towards the reason why this was happening. And in this case, we want the institutions to be part of the conversation and ask themselves, what are the uses they have? Not only the uses of art, but what are the uses they should have in this moment, political and social moments? What are the roles? So I don't know if that answer. Okay. Um, I have a question about like at what point do you care about like the categories of art, right? Or like <laughs> it keeps being called art because like you talked about aesthetics and how like that is something that continues to be important. So then it's like, well, what do aesthetics do in terms of communicating that other things can't? Mm -hmm. um, for me. Um, I, I mean, I, ha I have made a mission to create concepts 
as another kind of performance. It's a performance against the institution of our history, in a way. Uh, against the institution of critics who approach your work without looking at it but putting everything they think they know already in it. So the first uh, concept I created was Arte de Conducta because I, I was studying at the Art Institute and my masters and um, I was very happy finally I was studying performance but I didn't feel connected with what I was being taught. And I realized that I came from a different tradition of performance, which is a Latin American tradition of performance as activism, performance as something in people's life, not in a theater. Uh, there were a lot of uh, differentiations. And I wanted to, and also I really was bothered about performance and performing art. Everybody asking, oh, you, you play the flute? No, I'm a performance artist. So. <laughs> So I say, okay, if I use something like conducta, like behavior, there is impossible to detach that from its operational um, aspect in society. Um, so that's one, one thing. Um, um, the other thing is um, I am fighting very harshly for, um, for um, the respect or, 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 the, or the conversation around uh, the uses of aesthetics. Um, I feel that many of the way in which people define our work and many of the category, aesthetic categories used to define what we do, do not have any relationship with the times we are living. So all these categories are related to a practice that's happening in Europe at the beginning of the century. Why do we need to use that? See, everything else in society has changed. Why do we have to be, and I always feel like kind of prisoner of this, you know, because I'm like, this is not what I want. And for me, it's very clear when something is aesthetic. You know, I'm, I'm having, I mean, I want to see if I do a PhD so I can explain exactly what I mean, but, um, but uh, it, is, it is this kind of transformational moment where you realize that what you thought it was impossible is actually realizable. This is why I really want to rescue the idea of realizable utopias. Because a lot of people have like, I don't know, like allergy against utopia. <laughs> but I think it's a very important concept to rescue. No utopia in the Thomas More sense of like an island that is nowhere. By the way, I think it's Cuba. <laughs> I'm, I'm researching because I read in an article, no, no. I read in an article that Thomas More read the diaries of Christopher Columbus. So if that is true, you'll see me saying this over and over. Um, but I have to double check. <laughs> Um, but uh, not the Thomas More um, kind of impossible situation, but the kind of um, um, utopia that is a plan that you make that might fail. It's fine, but you know where you're going. And I think that's a difference uh, between people who have been raised, let's say, in socialist country and other, co uh, and probably capitalist countries. Like, we, I mean, you have to understand that the flexibility, but you have, you all, you never forget your goal, you know, your social and political goal. And this is something I do in my work. When I talk about aesthetic, I always talk about um, um, unstable aesthetics. Why? Because I try to do, first of all, transitional institutions. Meaning when I do the long-term projects, I do institutions that pop up when it's needed. When it's not needed, it doesn't exist. But also, um, I, I like this idea of uh, unstable aesthetics because you don't come with a preconception of what you have to do, but you are taking consideration how do you get to your place. And you, and you know, so it's a malleable form. So I, don't, I never go and say, I'm going to do a painting about this situation right now. Or I'm going to do an installation, a social engaged project. No, I say, OK, what are the goal? What is the goal? How can I get there? Who am I talking to? Who are the allies of the project? You know, am I right? Because maybe I'm wrong. 
I'm just a person with one brain, so you know, maybe I'm wrong. So, so I think all of this is the, what I call unstable aesthetics that at some point kind of crystallizes, but then it dissolves again because it becomes a new utopia. Because the idea of realizable utopia is like you achieve it, and as soon as you achieve it, you have to achieve another one. So it's said always a, a kind of revolutionary engine, you know? I don't know if that answer. Can you go back to Ana Mendieta and um, okay. talk a little bit about um, that early relationship and, mm -hmm. and the work that came out of that? Yeah, um, I think Ana Mendieta uh, was uh, a role model for me in a place where at that time uh, art was very macho in Cuba. So a lot of women student, art students, but very little women artists. Um, so. I saw in her this, this kind of role model, and, and we were supposed to meet her, because she was traveling all the time to Cuba. I was very young, I was your age when I did this. And, um, and then she died, slash was murdered. Um, and, and then that never happened. So I think that also, now many years later, I realized that a lot of my work is about loss, you know. Um, and what happened with that piece, and this is when you have, and I didn't talk about this, about the idea of political timing in specific, another concept I use is understanding what, what is happening around you. What is this political sensibility going on um, and coming from? And at that moment, um, a lot of Cuban artists were leaving the country because censorship and the government regu the, you know, policy at the time was whoever left disappears. Books out of the bookshelves and libraries forbidden to check at the, at the, at the library, you know, um, you know, take your CDs from the disc at that time, uh, from the stores or book, etc. So, so by, me, by me doing an homage to a person who was an immigrant from the country, it became at the eyes of the government like an uh, ode to the people who left. And, and, and actually part of my project was to rescue her uh, from, you know, as part of the Cuban uh, culture. So that was a friction that happened. But this is, I'm going to take advantage of this to talk about something else that is related, which is, um, well, this is not it. Um, that's the piece I did then. Uh, for example, when I did this piece in Cuba recently, I realized, and because this is something that happens in Cuba that is very interesting, and it will, you, I think there are many ways to censor people. And here you have a lot of censorship as well. Um, it is transvestite with some other things, but you have a lot of censorship. But one thing that I realized is that, uh, for example, in the piece I did in Cuba that I got into, they took my passport, etc. So um, I realized that um, I wanted to create another dialogue, a dialogue that was not confrontational, but how do you use art to teach power? You know, and in this case, for example, I decided to do uh, this piece that was reading uh, nonstop Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, and I knew because the, the, you know, the detentions I had before, um, that I had to talk to my interrogator, and I knew she had to learn who Tatling was, because my piece was called Tatling Whisper. And in order to repress me, she had to know who Tatling was. So I realized that in one of the interrogations, I was like, oh my god, that's great. So. I can, now it feels great, but at the moment it was not that great. But, um, but I say, okay, that's, that's, that's a good thing because it's a device I can use. The same way using Ana Mendieta as a, as a conduit to talk about the people that were leaving, something I didn't intend, but it was brought by the, the political atmosphere. In this case, I did the opposite. I created a political situation through art. 
by reading the book and by make them read part of the book, at least some paragraph, you know, meaning reading about themselves, you know. And, uh, and of course the reaction, which I'm very proud of, is like they, they were um, out of political resources to deal with it. So they had to deal with it by bringing these people who broke the, with the um, hack jammers, uh, jackhammers, no? uh, to break in front of my house so the noise was so high that nobody could listen the speakers I had. So I think that is a moment where you realize that that can be in verse. You know, I was like, okay, finally we're talking a language that is um, kind of uh, contaminating each other's language, you know. So that's what I talk about, artivism. And it came from Ana Mendieta from the beginning. Innocent, I didn't know it was uh, naive, but now I do it in part. Tanya, I want to thank you so much for coming, Thanks. and we look forward to bringing you back to Brown in a number of different capacities mm -hmm. in the future. I'd like to invite everybody out to the reception outside so you can get together and talk and ask some more questions. Thank, thank you. you very much. Much.